that I like that Erica is a good singing girl. <clears throat> I don't know if you got that from your mama or where you got that, but that's good. Good stuff. We appreciate that song. That's a great song. How y'all doing there? I went to Texas, Waco, Texas. How I many know Chip and Joanna? You know about them. You know, they go to church with some of my friends. They say they're, they're real just like they are, you know. So I'm walking around intentionally because I'm trying to break in a new camera guy back here that told me, now you stand still. <laughs> hi, Ren. How are you doing? Everybody turn around and wave at Ren. Ren Campbell. Say hi, Ren. Ren, Ren, Ren. Ren, 10, 10, 10. Anyway, I got a picture of my mama. She looks dead, man. She looks like death warmed over. Terrible. As a, like a first day there. The last day, she looks like better than she's looked in like five years. And I, someone over here, Jan, she told me, she said, don't you know children are like a medicine to their mama? So, so maybe it's because I went there. I don't know. But I went there to watch her die and not get better. So I wasted two weeks. <clears throat> I'm just kidding, Mom. I love my mother. She's 88 years old. Yeah, she knows the Lord. She prayed for me. She's not a perfect person, but she's a good one, a good egg. So I missed all of y'all, and uh, we've, been, we've been kind of in a series here. So we'll talk about that. But let me talk about this mission banquet a minute. Now, everybody say this banquet, not downtown. Just say banquet, not downtown. Say it. Banquet, not downtown. The High V Center is downtown, something like that. I don't even know. It's not down there. It's at the, in West Des Moines at the Hivey Corporation headquarters. It's the Ron Pearson Center. It's the finest banquet hall in all of the state of Iowa. The nicest. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible. Okay? And we have the Pope of the Assemblies of God coming to speak. <laughs> Former Pope. Former Pope. He's still kind of a Pope. He's kind of Pope too. And, uh, He's awesome, Dr. George Wood. And this meal, we're like, we're selling it to you like, it's, this is going to be the finest meal, and you will not run out of food. There's only a handful of tickets left. You go get them. My table's got one place left, one person. You go back there and say, I want to sit with old Weaver, all right? And those of you that are watching online, some of you have an excuse not being here. You know, you're a little older, it's slippery, feeble. I get it. But others of you, snow chickens, you should have been here today. I got one for you. And those of you that are out in the sun, you know, why is spring break in the winter? Did you bring that up, Pastor Jeff? I don't know. But those of you down there enjoying the sun, towers and some of you other people, <laughs> right now I don't like you very good. I'm just saying that right now. I asked myself when I was in Texas, who put the pulpit down? In the early service, I came up here, and this pulpit's way down here like it is a movable pulpit. And I said, I can tell the midget preached last week. <laughs> and here's a who you calling the midget sign right here. Now I got to put it back up, Dr. Dawkins. I heard you called, I heard you called Pastor Zach, Pastor Jack. Is that true? And he called you Don Rawkins or something like that? I know what it was. Hey, we love each other. We had a guest come to church one time, and they came down here. They were right down there. I remember Pastor Jeff. He always gets the weirdos. And he was, <clears throat> he was there to pray with them. He's real sincere. And a person said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm here to pray for your st pastoral team. Pastor Jeff, well, okay, what, what do you pray? Well, there's such division and disunity. They can't stand each other. Pastor just said, no, we love each other. No, they, no, listen how they talk about each other. And so that's the true thing. He said, no. He said, I'm not praying for that. <laughs> so I don't know what he said. I don't think the person stayed in the church because he didn't, we wouldn't pray for the pastors getting unified, unified and all that. Hey, we're unified. We love each other. We just like to make fun of each other, right? I mean, if you look like me, you deserve to get made fun of, right? <laughs> Mentioning and look like, looking funny, there's a pastor, former pastor of our church here, Bud Fortney, He's a funny looking one. Stand up, you and Laura, uh, with your family. Where are y'all at over there? We want to recognize you, Pastor Bud, our former children's pastor. Laura, your kids, God bless you. Yep. Anyway, that, this breakfast, men, don't let the women 
outnumber you in the brunch. It's because they got fancy like dishes. They're going to dress all up and got cloth and like decorations. You know, they're going to have like a, a tea bar and like, you know, a hot chocolate bar, you know, like where you put all fancy stuff in it and everything and it's going to be a fancy meal. You got to have a ticket to get in there. You go to the breakfast, you get real food. You get a hard table. You get eggs and bacon and biscuits and gravy, and fruit and real coffee. Okay, none of this foo-foo girl drink stuff that they're going to do. <laughs> Eight o'clock, sign up out there so we can make enough food and don't miss it. That's this Saturday. We're going to have a good time, all right? Take your Bibles, turn to Romans 11, 33. Romans 11. This one will not be on the screen, so you're going to have to pay attention. I like that choir number. Uh, uh, we did that because of the title of my sermon. My sermon is not a how to fix your marriage, how to raise your kids, uh, how to run your finances, how to be successful, how to do this. This is like, this is one of these sermons like the cement is wet and you jump in and then let it harden around your feet. In other words, this is theology. Some preacher around here in this town keeps popping off about we don't need theology or doctrine, these doctrine sermons. Listen, you're going to be flip-flopping all over everywhere unless you got your, ground, your feet grounded set in theology. We've been on the basics. Here's some theology. Jesus established two ordinances, water baptism. We baptize about 40 some odd people. Holy communion, basics, water baptism, communion, basics, prayer, believe in God, faith. Faith comes from the word. Basics, Pastor Hawkins, this book is true. Whether you like it or not, you may not agree with it, but it, who, who says God cares about what you agree with? If he says that it's right, not what you say, right? It's the divine, God-breathed, inspired Word of God, and it's correct, and you're wrong if you disagree with the book, all right? I understand there's little differences in interpretation, and I could be wrong, but I'm talking about when it comes to what's very clear here, this is the authority. How many believe that? And when you have the Word that's the authority that speaks of a mighty God who answers prayer, then you can pray in faith because faith comes by hearing the Word of God or hearing from God. God speaks and we hear, and that's how simple it is. You love God, you love man, you listen to God and do what He says, and that's how simple it is with walk with God. You know, I don't care how much you have a feeling experience with the Holy Spirit or whatever else you experience with salvation, you have to learn to walk with God, to be led of the Spirit, to hear God and follow God. It's that simple. God, it's something special for you to do. Even the gifts of the Spirit all work when you hear God. The Spirit directs you and leads you, and he, he will. It's a powerful thing. And we don't serve a weak God. We serve a mighty God. And the reason I preach on the Holy Trinity today is because uh, it speaks of so much. Just saying Holy Trinity says a lot about who God is. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as the choir sang, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. It says, clothed in power and in grace, the name above all other names, God, the mighty God, revealed in three persons, Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Father, God our Father, and by His Holy Spirit. Today we're going to look at the biblical foundation, we're going to look at the human explanation, and we're going to look at the, the proclamation of the truth of the Holy Trinity. And I want you to put your ears on and help me out a little bit. This is, like I said, it's kind of, guys, look, look at me, young people. Listen, this is where you go. I'm going to grow up and listen and learn something so I have theology that doesn't take me away in college. This is big stuff, okay? All right. A lot of people put out Christianity because of this doctrine right here. How can you serve a God that's three different gods? We don't serve three gods. We serve one God in three persons. Holy, 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 mighty God. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. That's who we serve. The biblical foundation is the, the first point. And I want to I read something about God that I think that you ought to leave here with uh, about God from the, this message on the Holy Trinity, Romans 11, starting in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You know, Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. That uh, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end leads into destruction, right? The Bible, the Bible tells us that 
that uh, who are we in that God would be mindful of us, and yet he is because God is so, so amazing and so past finding out, his ways past finding out. Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? 35, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen and amen. When you think of God, when you think of the Holy Trinity, I don't want you to see Santa Claus. I don't want you to see your papa, you jump up in papa lap. I want you to see a mighty God who can do all things. And at the close of the service, if you need sins forgiven, guess what? This is a mighty God, a God in three persons who will forgive sins. This is a mighty God who can fill your soul up with the Spirit. This is a mighty God who will reveal himself to you, make himself known. He's mighty, and he's powerful, and he's beyond our understanding totally. Billy Graham says, I believe it. I don't understand it all, but I believe it. And I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the three in one. How about you? I believe. And uh, so today, uh, as we've looked, looked at some of the basics here, today, based upon this Word of God that is true, we're going to take a look with our finite mind at the infinite God, who's all-powerful, all-knowing, present at all times and all places, an eternal God, creator of the universe, uh, that, uh, to, to, that we're going to try to look at him, but we'll never, ever be able to totally comprehend God. Not totally. He's so beyond us. You know, our culture has lost the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom, and the wisdom is the application of knowledge. And our culture has lost the fear of God. We just approach him so frivolously and without awe and reverence. The Word of God declares who he is, and uh, we need to pay attention to all that the Word has to say about who God is. From the beginning of creation in Genesis to the end of times of Revelation, God refers to himself as, refers to himself as us, or he says our, and thus describes the doctrine of the Trinity. The word Trinity comes from the word tri, which simply means three, and, and uh, 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 the, the, then the word unity meaning one, trinity, the trinity, the word unity meaning one. Three in one. God is three distinct individuals, God the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in one true God. You got that? We say Holy Trinity or Trinitarian. We're a Trinitarian people. We believe in God in one and three persons revealed, revealing himself to us. <clears throat> How many of you know where it, the Bible says the word Trinity? You know where it says it? It doesn't say it. It's just like it doesn't say the word rapture. It refers to a truth that's throughout Scripture of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, to be caught up the word rapture. The word Trinity, theologians put it together in a way to communicate many doctrines at once. Many doctrines at once when you understand God is one in three persons. Uh, and it can't be found in the Bible, but the truth of it can. And there's one God, the God had to consist in three distinct people, and all are equally omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal, unchanging, but they're each unique in their function. And uh, I want to go through, for the biblical foundation, point one, a number of verses. And in these verses, from creation to the birth of Christ to declaring God's work through His Spirit, through Christ, through God the Father, you'll see many of the verses where Jesus himself is speaking of the Spirit and the Father, and he, Jesus is there talking about his Father and about the Spirit. You'll see other verses where all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, are mentioned in these verses. In verse, 1 Corinthians, so uh, Pastor Zach says, uh, note takers or world changers, what I want you to write down is only the references, okay, in case you need to go back. But there's some powerful truths here, and God will speak to you as I read them, many verses here. It says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come, and from, and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through him we live. That verse looks like they're one, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians three seventeen. Now the Lord is the Spirit. That's Jesus. He's the Spirit. Holy Spirit and Jesus, they're one, the same. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom or liberty. 
2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, there's the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Colossians 2, 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God in Christ in bodily, is in, in Christ in bodily form. That's what it says. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Christ is God. He's Almighty. And he's our Father. It's kind of kind of strange. Everybody understanding this? No, you're not. I don't understand it. Billy Graham can't even understand it. I mean, yeah, you're understanding what I'm saying, but you're not really understanding. One God in three persons. It's impossible to understand. John 1, 14. Well, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh. The Word that was God put on flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is divine. When you say, oh, blessed Trinity, I think immediately, Jesus is God. I think immediately, the Holy Spirit is God. I think immediately, God the Father is God. I think immediately, they are one. Three distinct people. Not just a presence, but three distinct people that is all God, but they're one. Luke 1, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. There's being, being told to Mary, the Holy Spirit's there, the Most High will overshadow you, that's God, and the Holy One will be born, that's Jesus, the Son of God. Matthew 1, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus is God with us. Jesus is God. He's not just a prophet like the other religions. This is why the doctrine of Trinity is so important. We don't serve Jesus, some great leader of the Christian faith. He's not just a great teacher or a rabbi. He is God the Son, not just a son of God like we're sons and daughters of God. He is God the Son. He is deity. You call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 28, 19. This is the commission for us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not unintentional. That's intentional. By the way, you're all called to go. You go to your work. You go to your neighborhood. You go to your family. You go to your school. Everywhere you go, you have a voice to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. And you're all called to send. You hear me? That's why we do missions. We send them. We give to send others, to go where we are not called to go, around the world. Go into all the world. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Acts 1 that we might be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, all over. We give that others can go, and we pray. We send, we go, and we pray. We give to send, and we pray, and we go ourselves. You don't get out on any of it. And by the way, there are a lot of people who will give to build a hospital. There are a lot of people who will give to a social cause. There are a lot of people who will give to build this or build that, to build universities, donate to all kinds of secular places. But if you're God's going to be, there's plenty of money among secular people who know, may know about God but may not be with God. There's plenty of money to build all that, to give all that, but where the money's needed is in the kingdom of God. It's not needed in the political arena. It's not needed in the business arena. It's not needed anywhere else. They can get their money. But there's always a shortage because every dollar makes a difference for the kingdom of God. And I say give as much as you can to the kingdom of God, not because the church wants your money or benefits me, so that the gospel can be propagated. And I say it unashamedly that missions is the heart of God. My favorite two weekends coming up, missions and missions. Two of the greatest speakers you've ever heard, too, and some great missionaries. Don't miss it. Be here. Don't miss it. Uh, and then, uh, oh, by the way, this is when you get old, you do this kind of stuff. Those of you that are watching because you woke up late and you didn't check your clock, next year we're sending you a, a, a bill for double tithe, just to be aware of that. <clears throat> so, that's just a joke. You know, you know that. 
you have to clarify. People get so sensitive about money, you know, you got to clarify stuff. Matthew 3, 16, 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. There's Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit sending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. There's the Father speaking out loud where people can hear. John 14, 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, there's God the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. That's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives within you and be in you. He's in you. By the way, you know why Jesus comes into you by his spirit? You know why God comes into you? Into your heart. Well, I love the song, into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Why? Because Jeremiah says that, uh, it says that we are, our heart is desperately wicked. Did you know the heart's not just emotion, but it's thinking? Do you know that? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's what the scripture says. It's how you feel, it's how you think. That's why the renewing of the word changes your thoughts. You see, when you get close to God, here's the end result. When you hear God, when you get close to God, when you walk with God, you think the way God thinks, you feel about things the way God feels about them, and you see things the way God sees them. That takes spiritual revelation. It takes the Holy Spirit illuminating the truth. And that's when you're close to God. And so we got to know the real God. We don't want some toy God that the world has made up and, and, and <clears throat> modern day religion talks about, like he's some grandpa or Santa Claus. We want a holy God, a God that we reverence and bow before, a God that can do anything. And then here's R Romans 14. Verse 17 and 18, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So we have God, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have Jesus Christ all in that verse. Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In 1 John 5, 7, and 8, it says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedient to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and be, uh, be yours in abundance. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. There's God the Father in Christ. He anointed us. There's the Holy Spirit. Set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That's what happens at salvation. He puts his spirit in your heart to change your heart to reveal truth, the spirit of truth. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Even in the gifts, you have the different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There's a Holy Spirit that distributes them. <clears throat> different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There's Jesus. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and everyone, it is the same God at work. You have the spirit, the Lord, and God Almighty. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In, first, in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17, the Son is the image of the invisible God. You, you see Jesus on earth, you saw God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, who, that is, that's Jesus, in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. What did Genesis 1, 1 says? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. What does this say? It says, for in Jesus, all things were created. They're one. They're the same. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. Things in heaven and on earth, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Without Jesus Christ, our God, we would have nothing being held together. John 14, 9 to 11, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone has seen, 
seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, Jesus said, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am the Father, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe the, uh, the, on the evidence of the works themselves. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus had, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality, excuse me, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death, even the death on the cross. He was equal with God. He was God, but he became a man. You know, you know the story of Abraham and Isaac? And Isaac is going up, and he's following God's in obedience. He's going to sacrifice Isaac. Do you know the literal language, original language, when it says he looked over, he's about to take Isaac's life and offer him on the, sac on the altar of sacrifice. He looked over, and he saw a ram caught in a thicket. You know what it says? God, the original language said God provided himself that sacrifice. In other words, that was God saying, I'm the sacrifice. You get that? The Old Testament, God says, I am, but we know that Jesus was a sacrifice. You see, when Jesus died, God died. They're one. It's hard to separate it. Now, distinctively, we understand there are works that they've done. That's why we're presented with three persons, and I don't even understand it. Do you really understand it? I don't think you understand it. But the Scripture makes it plain that there is one God in three persons. And, and, and not only it shows how each member of the Trinity fulfills a specific role, and reveals how those rows interact or interrelate to with each other. So in a simple terms, let me just say this. The Father creates a plan. He has a plan. Jesus Christ implements the plan. And the Holy Spirit administers the plan. And the way of redemption kind of showcases this and how we can see it. The Father designed and organized the way that a man would be saved and be redeemed. He sets in motion a complex set of events, actions, and prophecies which culminates in the life and the death of Jesus the Savior. So the Father designs and organizes the way a man's redeemed. Then the Son, he carries out the plan. He followed the Father's instructions to come to earth, even though it meant he would have to die. And then the Holy Spirit sees to it that every person feels a call toward Jesus Christ, God's saving grace. You can't come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit draw you. You can't just go, I'm going to be a believer. No, it's spiritual illumination that happens. In fact, you can't understand or believe this stuff. The reason Billy Graham said, I don't understand a lot of it, but I believe it, is because spiritual illumination, faith was put in our hearts. The reason that I, like a baby, accept God in three persons, the holy, blessed of Trinity, is because I walk with God and His Spirit illuminates that. And this, the reason I'm telling you this is because this is a big God. When I say that, I think of his majesty, of his grandeur, of his splendor, of his power, of his amazing works. And if you have a need today, the God, all of the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, they are here. All of God is here. And he does marvelous things. So why not believe this mighty God? Why not believe it? See, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're equal in divine attributes. They're equal. But each one relates to us as people differently. They have a specific role in our life. It's very important to understand, we do not have three gods. We have one God and three persons fun functioning uniquely and perfectly for us. That is a biblical explanation to the best that I can give it. I know there's better ones. Let me give you the human explanation. The doctrine of the Trinity is a reminder, again, of the majesty and the mystery of Jesus Christ, the one who gave himself on the cross, and God Almighty. It's a, it's a mystery about God. But when our finite mind, when our human mind, when our temporary mind encounters the infinite reality of all-powerful God, that's never, uh, there's no beginning and no end, who knows everything, who's always present everywhere, uh, who, who has all power, you know, when we, when we encounter an infinite reality of this mighty God, we struggle to express what we've encountered. 
We, the best way we can do is just use analogies to cope with it. So we use these analogies. And John Calvin points out, as well as other theologians, that um, uh, he emphasized that God adapts to our human weaknesses. He adapts and accommodates our limit, limited capability of a human being to understand uh, this eternal God. So, for example, they say, like, uh, so the Bible uses an analogy like a shepherd. Well, Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't a shepherd. He was only there as an analogy to help us understand about Jesus. There's many other, you know, Jesus taught in parables, stories. And, and, and those are to help our human um, weakness and understanding to comprehend an eternal, powerful God. We, we can't grab it all. So, I mean, when you start trying to use a, a, an analogy uh, or, you know, to talk about God, we come up, that's a problem. You can't really use an example to explain God. Uh, we hit a problem. No analogy for God is good enough. You know, the famous missionary, Patrick, you know, St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Day, not too good a day anymore. But anyway, he, he used the shamrock to teach about the Trinity, you know, and he, and, he, and he took it and he saw in the single leaf with three parts as a way to illustrate God in three persons. So when you see around St. Patrick's Day, the little thing say, it's a witness to it, say, see that? St. Patrick, he, he would use that to talk about God in three persons. One leaf, three little areas there, right? Oh, there you go. That's a pretty pathetic example, Patrick. But I got even more pathetic example. The egg, I use the egg. The egg's got a shell, it's got a white, and it's got a yolk. Three parts of the egg. There's mighty God, the egg. The egg council loves that. Someone said, well, explain it like this. They thought it was really good, and I, I agree, so I'll just say it as after service. And I forgot who it was, so if you're watching, I apologize. But they said, well, explain it this way. You know, it's like you're a grandfather, and you're a father, and you're a son. I get that, that's human analogies, the human but it's nonetheless weak and inferior, and it just misses who God is. There's more to the Trinity than analogies. They're feeble, weak attempts to a finite man to explain an infinite, almighty God. But the doctrine of Trinity enables us to grasp the majesty, the grandeur, the almightiness of God, you know, to... To, and, and it insists that we do justice to God and not dumbing him down to our ability as human beings to think things through. A lot of people throw stuff out because they just don't, oh, I don't agree with that. Well, the Bible says this. Yeah, but you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to serve a God like that. I don't agree with that. That's, that's got to be wrong somehow. That's what people do, you know? And, and so that's dumbing God down. See, the, the doctrine of Trinity invites us to expand our vision of God rather than reduce it to what we can cope with. We begin by reflecting on the great works of God in creation and then move to ponder the, ponder the wonderful work of redemption that happened on the cross. And finally, the presence of God that's with us all the time is amazing. That's part of the Holy Trinity of God. The Holy Spirit, He's among us. We can't see Him. He's in us, and God is with us. He's Emmanuel, Christ Jesus, in our hearts, and the Spirit is in us, and God is everywhere. Like, I don't get it. He's mighty. See, right from the beginning, Christians were convinced that in Jesus, they had experienced God's saving grace. And if Jesus reveals God, he must somehow be said to share the divinity with God, to be divine, to be God. The divinity of Jesus is communicated when we talk about Holy Trinity. When we say Holy Trinity, it says immediately, Jesus is God. Holy Spirit is God, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father. It's there. Otherwise, you wouldn't really have met God in Christ, and God would remain unknown if Jesus wasn't deity. If that were the case, God might stand behind Jesus, would, would not be shown or known through Jesus. The doctrine of the Trinity was formulated as a way of safeguarding just taking care of the basic convictions about salvation and the revelation of God. The precious truths that we can lose so easily and or uh, miss 
the, uh, the connecting ideas of who God is. You miss it without it. So it was genius. I mean, the Holy Spirit led, I believe, this idea. The word tr Trinity, like I said, is not in the Bible, but the doctrine is there. And it weaves these threads together, and it helps us get the big picture of God that is revealed in the Bible and confirmed in our experience of Christ in prayer and worship. And so uh, it's astonishing how rich and hard-won insights about God has come to us. And here's the deal. For the theologian, it just the, the Holy Trinity doctrine safeguards against the inadequate understandings of God. In other words, keeping God from getting dummied down. I mean, you can do that very easy by just taking pieces and bits and, you know. You know, our, our new superintendent, I heard him speak, a general superintendent, I can't remember his name, Doug Clay. He said the Holy Spirit put in his heart that what he needs to tackle is um, biblical illiteracy. And I can tell you right now, we don't hear messages like this because they're not fun. This is spinach. <laughs> and I'm having this, I'm doing my best to butter it and stick it in your throats. <laughs> because you need to know. You go off to college or whatever else, you're going to find out you got a problem. Rhonda, I just looked up and saw you there, sweetheart, and you and your kids. I just want you to know we're rejoicing at Denny's with Jesus. And he knew all about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And thank God for that. He and Jim Tuttle up there having fun. So it doesn't really help us to understand God, these, these uh, examples or these analogies, human, humanly speaking. But it will help us avoid inadequate ways of thinking about God. It will avoid, it'll help us avoid dummying God down to something he's not. He's not, he's not like a grandfather. Because I'm telling you, my grandkids can get anything they want out of me. My God's bigger than that. And faced with the choice between an invented God who can be easily understood without any trouble by mere mortals and faced with the idea of the biblical God who I can't totally comprehend, but I want to accept and believe what it declares about God. I'm glad our forefathers chose the do holy doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Amen. Because it tells us that God is one God in three persons, and it clearly communicates who God is and how great he is. And we worship him, and we adore him, and we stop to realize that there's nothing more than we can do than to sing one of the greatest hymns ever written. You love it. Reginald Heber's great hymn, Heber, Heber, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I wonder if the writer was going holy, holy, holy from Isaiah, or was he going holy, 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 Father, Son, Spirit? I think he was doing that. All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, holy, holy. He's merciful and mighty. God in three persons, the blessed Trinity. As the musicians come, I want you to think about all the scripture, the biblical explanation, the human explanation that's feeble and inadequate and I want you to get this as the application to take with you listen carefully is to proclaim it to proclaim it to believe it proclaim a mighty God a God the Father a father who loves us so much he didn't just give his own life he gave his son a father who knows everything and is always with us and he never turns his back and when you as a prodigal go away no matter how much look at me here no matter how much, how much, I know they're better looking than me, forget them. How much, how much you mess it up, the prodigal son, like the prodigal son, the father's looking, and the moment he takes a step toward it, he comes running, and he puts shoes on his feet, he puts a ring on his finger to say, you're mine, boy, and he puts a robe on his back, and he throws a big party. That's a father. Get a hold of mighty God, the father who created, right, and gave Jesus a son who didn't want to go to the cross, who's prayed, Lord, is there any other way? But he knew the suffering. He knew the pain and the agony. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And he went to the cross, this Jesus Christ. When you say Holy Trinity, 
then you think God the Father who loves you and chases after you and His mercies are new every morning. You think Jesus Christ the Son who gave His life for you, who taught you, who showed you mercy. He was an example of love. He was an example of grace, of tender kindness, of sacrifice. And think of the Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. For we are all, we are all by the same Spirit born into the family of God. In His Spirit, we're born again. And those of Romans 8 says, if you have the Spirit of Christ, you're, you're a part of Him. But if you don't have the Spirit, you're not born again. And then there's a second thing that can happen, the fullness of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. Listen, this, this, all this stuff, to think of it, all this stuff, we serve a, an unbelievable God beyond our comprehension that can do anything. And I don't know what you're worried about. God speaks to you to do something, to pastor a church or go to a mission field or to speak to someone or witness. He's going to empower you because you serve a mighty God. You're not weak. God's going to help you. He will not forsake you. He will never leave you. This is who we serve. And He's here today, and He's willing to hear your cry and answer your prayers and minister to you. And I believe in having people that love to pray, and they pray, and God uses them, and they just gifted that way, and they pray with you. But I also believe in the Holy Spirit nudging. And I would say anytime someone here sees some, thinks of someone over there, and the Holy Spirit says, go pray with them, that you respond. Or if you never have come up to pray with them, you see someone say, I need to come. That We need to hear God and follow God. It's okay. And help each other. You know something? We all have our junk too. Don't sit there all religious and looking at me. If you need something, it's okay. You don't have to tell anybody. Unspoken. It's okay. You may want to come pray for a, a friend, a relative, whatever. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's financial. Whatever it is, God, God knows. He cares. Just be willing to listen and do what He gives you to do, okay?